Space is a cruel mistress. In the vacuum of space, a spacecraft can experience extreme hot and cold temperatures based on its distance from the sun and orbit about a planet. As a result, spacecraft incorporate a control system to maintain hardware within an allowable temperature range so that they don't become damaged. To account for this, engineers not only have to have a very thorough understanding of the spacecraft's thermal environment, both on board the spacecraft and outside of it, but they also have to model this accurately. And most importantly, they have to validate everything by testing the spacecraft in a thermal vacuum chamber which can produce the environment that's expected throughout your mission. Now, while the con thermal control systems are essential for spacecraft, modeling and designing these is not an easy or straightforward task. And this topic is what we will explore in today's interview. Welcome to another episode of The Art of Space Engineering. I'm your host, Sarah Rogers, and in today's episode, I will be chatting with JPL thermal engineer Belinda Schreckengost on several topics that go into thermal engineering, including how thermal models and thermal control systems are developed, as well as how engineers prepare for thermal vacuum testing. So while we were working on the Phoenix CubeSat, we were incredibly fortunate to have Belinda as a mentor for our thermal team through a CAP partnership between ASU and JPL. And the guidance that we got from her was absolutely incredible, and it really helped us to develop a robust thermal model for our spacecraft. So given that, I wanted this episode to dive into some of the things that we learned about from her so that these lessons could be shared with others, and especially anyone out there who might be developing CubeSats of their own. So as you'll come to find from this episode, thermal engineering is such a cool topic. So I'm really excited that I get to share some of these insights with you. So without further ado, let's learn about thermal engineering. Welcome to my my snazzy uh, Zoom record studio. Thank you so much for having me. This is great. <laughs> no, thank you for thank you so much for like taking time out of your day to to do this with me. I think it's going to be really cool to chat thermal modeling and uh, help people understand what everything that goes into thermal modeling and thermal control is like. So, um, so I, I thought, why don't we start this off by getting to know you a little bit better? so that you're not this like mysterious shadowy guest that I'm interviewing. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your career JPL, and then what projects you're working on now. Oh, great. Um, well, hi everyone. My name is Belinda Schreckengast. Uh, I am a thermal engineer and I'll be talking today what that means. Uh, I've been at JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, here in Pasadena, California for about 15 years. And I actually worked at another company, uh, Raytheon Santa Barbara Remote Sensing. I was known as SBRS for five years prior to that. So just over 20 years experience in the industry. And I've worked on a variety of missions, uh, Earth orbiting spacecraft and on some planetary and deep space missions. But one of the ones that I'd like to mention, since it's very present right now, we're excited with an upcoming launch for our Mars 2020 mission with the Perseverance rover. Um, that launch date, uh, the window opens on July 30th in 2020, and uh, so we're just excitedly waiting for that to happen. Uh, but also, I've been working on uh, something called the Coronagraph Instrument, CGI, on the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. So this is an exciting mission that's going to be the next big space telescope, and our goal is to support exoplanet detection and uh, direct imaging methods for, for planet detection. So... Uh, for us in the thermal world, uh, this is an exciting instrument because it has to be very thermal and mechanically stable in order to take all these very precise measurements. So exciting stuff. Are you guys planning a, a really fun launch party? Because that's that's only a week away is per, uh, Perseverance launch. So Yeah, only, only a week away. Um, unfortunately, uh, we are in our stay-at-home order right now. So the parties are online, but uh, we have our t-shirts, we have our stickers, and we're ready for a successful launch. Very cool. Very cool. So going a little bit more into your, into your background, what, what's one of the things that actually got you interested in doing thermal engineering in the first place? So it's actually a fun story. Um, I sort of say it's a bit of the luck of the draw. Um, when we're in uh, school and looking forward to our careers, uh, sometimes we find threads and paths that take us in different directions. Uh, for myself, I was in my third year at Harvey Mudd College, uh, where I got my undergraduate degree. And looking for a summer internship, 
And working with our alumni office, they suggested I contact an alumni who worked at the time at Hughes Space and Communications, which is now Raytheon. And he suggested I come in for an interview and uh, introduced me to thermal engineering, which was not a discipline I was aware of before. Uh, my job was doing thermal analysis for their avionics place, basically these very large platforms that host avionics on communication satellites and looking at how the heat flows from these heat generating elements to radiators and cooling capabilities of the spacecraft. So I hadn't taken any thermal engineering courses yet, but I learned a lot that summer and I was hooked from there. Very cool. So, so to do that, did they, did they just say, hey, we think it'd be really cool for you to work on this. And then these are the equations that you need. And this is how you need to think about it. Or how, like, how did they actually instruct you <laughs> on what to do? So, you know, it's interesting. Thermal is uh, really just a couple of key equations, heat transfer. You have convective heat transfer, conductive heat transfer, and rate of heat transfer. So in your basic engineering courses, you will learn those. Um, the rest of it was really on the job. How do we apply these three methods of heat transfer? And incidentally, only two of them, if convection is gone in the vacuum of space, uh, how do we apply that in our analysis tools, make predictions and understand the heat transfer and then how to manage it? That, that was all on the job training. So it was, a, it was an important summer, a critical summer for me. So I can't say enough about how important internships are uh, informing your path and your career forward. Yeah, definitely. Like, uh, I mean, like we've, like you, like you were saying, we have classes like thermofluids and heat transfer, but they, they don't cover the same kind of stuff you have to think about um, with thermal modeling. You have coatings that you have to consider. You have different radiative properties from the Earth if you're working on a, on a Leo mission, and so you, you have to take all of that in, into consideration, and all, you have all of these variables to like just play around with and really understand and, and make sure that your modeling goes correctly. So that's yeah, I. That is really a lot that goes into it for sure. Yeah. So I'm very grateful for all my mentors through through my career and even today. And that, that's that's also really cool too. Like I I love stories where it's like people have just found their passion because they you know they kind of got it was luck of the draw they stumbled into this uh, in, into something. Um, we actually got a couple of really awesome people on Phoenix because they just stumbled into our warehouse or they stumbled into the lab and they ended up. Um, just really contributing to the project. So I always find those stories kind of hilarious in a way. So kind of going off of that, what advice would you give students who are looking to pursue a career in thermal engineering within the industry or, or at least just interested in exploring it a little bit more? Right. Um, so I mean, find the thermal engineering classes in your curriculum. Uh, get those on your schedule as soon as you can. Uh, one of the key classes is thermal radiation because that's a primary method of heat transfer when we're talking about spacecraft design. Um, but another thing to keep in mind is that thermal engineering, while we're thinking about heat transfer, we're a system level discipline. So when you're managing an overall spacecraft, you need to understand the safety and performance of all the different elements, the propulsion system, the avionics system, uh, even the structural design of the spacecraft. So uh, you want to get those classes under your belt as well. And a lot of schools now will offer system design courses that give you a, a buffet of topics, looking at all the different aspects of, of the spacecraft. And I found those to be very valuable. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. Like, that's one of the things that we learned really quickly on Phoenix is that, like, you, you know, you have your systems engineers and you think that, okay, systems engineering is like, you have to understand the whole spacecraft. And it's like, well, no, that's, I mean... Yes, they do, but really everyone has to understand how all of the parts play in together because that's how you ask questions and that's how you catch things. So um, that I, I appreciate that you, you brought that up as well. That's good. In addition to classes, do you have any other additional resources that you, you know, typically go to for, um, for thermal engineering? Uh, well, when I actually first started at JPL, I was handed a book um, and the team joked that this is, this is our thermal Bible. Um, and uh, that book is the Spacecraft Thermal Control Handbook, Volume 1, Fundamental Technologies. And uh, Volume 1 was edited by David G. Gilmore. Uh, he's actually a thermal engineering specialist at Aerospace Corporation, a great deal of experience. And this book he put together is a compilation of chapters, essays, memos, and so forth uh, across the industry of various uh, thermal applications. So it was a wealth of information. I learned so much, read that cover to cover. Uh, and I even picked up volume two, uh, which is specific to cryogenic applications, a very cold temperature. Uh, this was put together by editor Martin Donabedian, 
And uh, cryogenics is its own very unique, challenging topic. So that uh, was also an incredible resource. Uh, otherwise, uh, mentors. I'm very fortunate uh, working at JPL. We have a large thermal group. So there's, there's always someone I can call depending the specific topic and application I have in mind. So ask questions. Ask questions, talk to people, utilize those resources, and people are very happy to work with you. Um, I also wanted to mention just uh, for the record for folks that are looking online about some of the specific missions we've been talking about, uh, there's some good websites, uh, mars.nasa.gov, if you want to know more about the upcoming Mars mission, or you can go to the general page, uh, www.nasa.gov slash missions, and you can look up the various Na NASA missions that are happening, including the one uh, that I mentioned, the Na Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. So check those out as well. Yeah, the um, yeah, I would I, I've taken a look at the thermal control handbook. That is a bible. That that is like is a huge book, and it's so much information. It's really cool. I haven't looked at part two, um, but I like cryogenics as a subject. Just seems really really interesting, and the the book has little penguins on it too. So that's also kind of cute. <laughs> It's, it's a real interesting topic. I actually I actually got to tap into some cryogenic work uh, at my time at Raytheon and a little oh, bit of JPL as well. It's incredibly interesting. So, Mil, you know, milliwatts matter. In our world, we talk about watts as, you know, uh, quantity transfer. You get into milliwatts and you talk about cryogenics and very cold temperatures. So it's fascinating. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's cool that you mentioned. That was going to be my follow-up question. So that's that's cool that you mentioned that as well. <laughs> But yeah, okay. Maybe I'll uh, wait until I've worked in the industry for a little while, and then uh, Amazon can take my money uh, to to buy to buy part two. <laughs> or your um, local bookseller. Oh yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that is very true. Well, awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so now that we've introduced you a little bit, uh, I thought let's kind of discuss more of like the thermal modeling and then thermal control side of things, uh, segueing off of that. So. The first thing that goes into any kind of modeling is your requirements, um, because requirements are the root of any kind of system design. So um, I thought it would be cool to discuss w just what kinds of requirements that you have to work with as a thermal engineer. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, like I said, requirements are everything. That's the first and foremost, uh, asking the questions of what does this mission have to do? Because we're also sy system engineers as thermal engineers, we want to know Where's the mission heading? What is, what is its purpose and its goal and function? Um, specifically to thermal, we need to know its environment. Is it in orbit? Is it in deep space? Is it going to another planet? And also what's the lifetime? So once we kind of understand the parameters and design of the system, we then want to talk to the cognizant engineers for each hardware element and ask what is the capability of the hardware you're putting together? Uh, we need to know how much power the component dissipates. So we know what heat we have to transfer what temperatures it can survive at, what temperatures it needs to operate at. Uh, these are, can often be different values. Uh, whether or not there is thermal stability requirements, that can be very important, particularly for optical systems. And uh, in general, these, these sort of parameters help us define the type of thermal control that's needed, whether it can be very loose within a wide temperature range or something uh, very stringent. So within that, there's also like, um, I know you guys have margins that you have to, so so you have your qualification temperatures, which is like, this is what this hardware is rated to, and then your allowable flight temperatures, which is this is what this hardware can go up to uh, for the purposes of, of the mission. So how how do you define the margin between the two? Isn't, isn't there's standards for uh, JPL, if I remember correctly? You are on your way to being a thermal engineer. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, we want to have a safety margin. Our Office of Safety Mission Assurance wants to make sure that, that we have padding, if you will, between the capability of hardware and then what we're eventually going to fly and exercise that hardware to. So as you mentioned, qualification is a temperature range to which we test and fully qualify the hardware that it functions and meets all of its requirements. But then we pull a little margin back from that and say that when we're in flight, and in our final testing, we verify that we keep what's called an allowable flight temperature, or AFT. And the margins between those, which could be about minus 15 degrees on the cold side plus 20 degrees on the hot side, 
is something that's defined in our guiding principles. So uh, all of our projects follow these, these design practices. And those can be different with different organizations. JPL has their principle, uh, NASA and other centers have uh, different margin philosophies that they follow based on their experience. Okay, oh, so that's all just set uh, based on what's, I guess, worked well for them in terms of um, uh, on orbit lessons learned from thermal design or instrument design. Right, absolutely. Okay. Interesting. So, so the other aspect of at least, uh, at least the, the thermal modeling scenario is, is the thermal environment. So one thing I thought would be cool to talk about is like what different factors go into the thermal environment for spacecraft, say, in low Earth orbit. So, so like what factors are you modeling in software to um, like dictate what the spacecraft is seeing? To answer that, we would go back to, again, the three modes of heat transfer. So we know we have conductive, radiative, and convective. And so we want to ask ourselves, you know, both from the environment perspective as well as internal to the spacecraft, you know, where are our heat loads and what are the met methods that that heat can transfer? So when you're thinking about when you're in the vacuum of space, uh, you really only have two of those methods of heat transfer because in a vacuum, we're not worried about uh, convective. So for radiation, we're looking at uh, internal to spacecraft, how we, you know, what, what surfaces we have that we can radiate heat away. But then there's also energy impinging on those surfaces. So you have the sun, for example, which uh, here on the surface of Earth, we get a, a nice attenuation from our atmosphere. We're protected from the sun's uh, total uh, energy. But in space, you have direct uh, view to, to the sun's rays. So we have to uh, include that and account for that in our surface properties and how much energy is absorbed on those surfaces. And then we also have the cold of space, um, which is a heat sink for us. So we can radiate energy from surfaces of our spacecraft out, out to the space environment. So those are really things we want to look at is where is the sun's orientation? What is being illuminated? What is the orientation of our spacecraft and our radiating surfaces? Uh, do they have a clear view uh, to reject heat into space? And then throwing in with that, if you're in a LEO orbit, you have the planet beneath you. And if you look at the orbital dynamics, LEO is actually pretty close, relatively speaking, in orbits where it has a very broad view of the planet. So if it's looking down like it we're looking in a camera, it sees Earth out most of its peripheral vision, which means all that heat and energy from the Earth is coming back up to the spacecraft. So we have to account for that in our modeling as well. And that would be very different than if we're in, say, a deep space mission where we don't have energy from the planet uh, reflected back to us. So how does the um, beta angle play into thermal modeling? So beta angle is uh, describing the angle of the sun. Um, whether it's incident to you or at an oblique angle. And if you look at the cosine of that angle, uh, you would see that a fraction of that energy is absorbed by a surface. So if it's directly impinging to your surface, you would you know, absorb the full uh, intensity, whereas if it's reflecting from an angle, it's partial intensity. So that becomes very important for us to understand those relative angles of both the, the sun to our orbit position as well as to the attitude of our spacecraft, which is its relative placement um, in pointing. So that's all included in our models. And uh, we have some very sophisticated modeling software now that you can actually put the spacecraft in an orbit at the appropriate beta angle relative to the sun, and you can even articulate the spacecraft within that orbit to get the correct pointing. Right. Cool stuff. Yeah, yeah, because you have like, you know, you have uh, orbits where like some of them are colder and some of them are warmer. And so you have to kind of like, take all of that into consideration with, with the modeling as well. Right, and, and even thinking about, you know, some spacecraft are very sensitive to the relative change in the albedo effects um, mm -hmm. coming from the planet. The, the energy reflected black, back from the planet can change as we go over the poles versus going over the equator. So in some scenarios, we actually take into account the geography of the planet. What, what kind of scenarios dictate that actually? Uh, what really comes down to uh, the fidelity of your modeling, which in turn comes down to what is required for that mission. Do you need millikelvin level control or right. do you need to control within five degrees or so? That, that can be a pretty substantial difference in terms of how carefully we have to model uh, small variations in our environment and how much can be uh, approximated in the model. Gotcha. Okay. So we kind of started to talk about software there a little bit. Um, so I know oh. that you... <laughs> you got to talk about software eventually. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. 
Now this is all done with magic and uh, chalkboards. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of time. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't have a chalkboard in my office, though, unfortunately. Right. <laughs> um, so I, I know that you normally use. Uh, it, your go-to one is, is has been Thermal Desktop, uh, but I know that there's other softwares out there like NX. Um, so, what what draws you more towards Thermal Desktop than something else? Is is there a benefit in using one over the other, or is it mostly just based on preference, based on what you've seen? Uh, it's a very loaded question. Um, <laughs> start, no, no, it's a great question. Um, for me, uh, Thermal Desktop was one of the earlier tools that I used in my career. Uh, I found it very simple in its interface. Um, but really, I guess taking a step back before we get to software, the thing I would like to say is that, number one, you need to understand the behavior of your system mathematically and fundamentally before you start diving into tools. So we want to know when we're thinking about heat transfer, what is the temperature at this end? What is the temperature at this end? What is the conduction between the two? And are the results what we expect given the, the heat flow? Can, can we do the simple equation and make the math work out and convince ourselves the system looks correct? Only then should you go into a software tool now where you're adding complexity and additional fidelity beyond what you can do in pen and paper very easily. And what I liked about Thermal Desktop is that it gave me that visibility. It actually was, had a very you know, simple user interface and in putting in the parameters, and it would export it out in a text file in Fortran format. And back in the day, I was coding in Fortran and making these text input files by hand. So I could see the inputs that were going in and be able to uh, verify the results quite easily. Um, but that was back in the day, and I mentioned I've been in the industry 20 years, and software gets more and more complicated uh, as it helps us solve uh, more and more difficult problems. So uh, there's a variety of software out there now that, that can, can function um, in different ways depending on what you need. So I think Thermal Desktop is still my go-to because I'm very familiar with it and I think it really covers uh, fundamentals. It also has enhanced its features with mapping temperatures uh, where we look at a thermal model and we map it to a structural model to understand how it will perform. I think we can talk more about that. Um, but there's also other tools out there now. Um, I've used something called uh, Ideas TMG. There's NX Space Systems Thermal. Uh, these are other tools that interface with different CAD environments that uh, can give you some ability to uh, produce finer meshes or interface more with the uh, CAD modeling, whereas a Thermal Desktop is based in an AutoCAD format. So depending on the models you're coming from, uh, that can also make an influence. So, and then, of course, we're system discipline. We're working with other elements. What do other members of your team use, and particularly the CAD design world, which is uh, computer-assisted drafting? Um, depending on the tools they use, they may or may not interface better with your software. So it can be very uh, specific to where you're working and who you're working with, too. Okay. Learn them all. I recommend <laughs> you just <laughs> give them a try. Right. Yeah, I know some people who will, um, they'll use like NX, but like they also do their structural model in NX. So it's it's convenient for them to, or and it's useful too, to actually use that to do like a detailed analysis. Um, so right. yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, I remember like, and, and you're right, yeah, Thermal Desktop is a very, it's a very elegant software. Um, but it, it's very backwards from SolidWorks, which is what I was used to. And so I remember when I first started learning it, I was, I know it was it was very like counterintuitive and there's a learning curve to it, but it's it's awesome. Like once you get used to it, it's really awesome. Yeah. Um, going more off of creating thermal models, uh, what are some rules of thumb that you typically follow for modeling itself? Um, well, I guess first and foremost, uh, what is the purpose of the model? Um, we can go from a very generalized level of uh, what, you know, what are the rough temperatures of the spacecraft? How big does my radiator need to be in order to reject this amount of heat? And you can do that with uh, just approximation, a uh, very, uh, large masses assigned to each node, so a few nodes, which, which are a way that we tie these models together to represent a majority sections of the spacecraft, and that can get you your answer pretty quickly. And what's nice about a simple model like that, one, you can check the hand calcs, you can do the equations. If you have five nodes in your model and five nodes on a piece of paper, you can make sure things are behaving as you expect them to, and also it runs very, very quickly if you want to do design trades. Um, but if you want something uh, with a lot more fidelity, if we're talking about Lily Kelvin level temperature control. We're talking about very small gradients or understanding 
gradients from one point to another in a structure, you're going to need a much finer mesh. So then you start looking at uh, increasing your mesh density. You're making these, these elements, these computational uh, components very, very small. And then the software is going to perform this myriad of calculations for you very quickly and give you uh, more precise uh, results. So that, that becomes really important to think about. So understanding uh, your customer and what they need uh, from your analysis. And so your, um, let's see, when you get your requirements, your, does the customer usually dictate like how many nodes you're allowed allowed to use um, based on how complex like the, the whole, like if you're working on a large spacecraft, for example, and you're just doing the instrument part of it, like that's a lot of, that's gonna be a lot of nodes in eventually. So is that kind of where um, at least the fidelity comes from? Yeah, and uh, so that's when thermal engineers are working together. Um, mm -hmm. So you'll, you'll have a thermal engineer dealing with a very large spacecraft, and then thermal engineers who are looking at subcomponents of that spacecraft, perhaps instruments. And uh, we need to understand jointly what is the goal for the overall model. Again, we go back to if you just want rough temperatures and radiator sizing, you can do that with relatively few nodes, and it's, it's not necessarily a concern. But if we're doing a very detailed analysis, there are limitations in what our software and our computers can do. Uh, we don't want to create a model that's so large it takes a week to run. We have built models that large and they're right. cumbersome. <laughs> and then user error inevitably means, darn, I have to repeat that whole analysis. Right. And you don't or like it runs for a day and then it's like, oh, this wasn't what I thought. Like, oh. <laughs> I forgot this one thing. <laughs> Whoops, didn't check that box. So. <laughs> So you want to find kind of a happy medium. So there's a lot of dialogue that happens where we're trying to figure out what can we get from the model, what do we need, and what's a reasonable size. Once we know that, the system thermal engineer will, will usually portion sections out to the components and give them a node element count to keep the overall model size uh, in control. So, so that's a lot of back and forth. Um, you can also do various studies, um, we call mesh density studies, where you can take a part and just keep meshing it finer and finer and finer and repeating the analysis until you see the results converge to mm -hmm. the acceptable level of whatever uh, result you require. Very cool, very cool. Um, so what one thing you mentioned earlier was that it's it's very important to make sure you understand the math behind your model before you ever start modeling. So eventually it, it's, you know, you need something to, to check all of those models um, because it's, it's important that you understand what you're doing. So um, one thing I wanted to ask was what are some ways that you typically check your thermal model to make sure that it's correct before you actually get to the TVAC stage where now everything's integrated and it's all about model validation. So um, what tools do you use for doing this and kind of how are these tools normally set up? Um, so we already kind of talked about doing the checks, you know, the hand calcs, does the math work out, do the results make intuitive sense. Um, but within the model tools themselves, uh, many of them come with, and Thermal Desktop in particular, come with some features to do quality checks on your model. Um, basically performs calculations, uh, looking at things like, are all the nodes connected? Is there a continuous line from one to another or some of them floating? And you could have two nodes that are very close together that should have been merged that you didn't see without zooming in. Uh, checks things like, are your elements of a, a reasonable quality? And the quality meaning if you have an element that's very skewed, you picture a, a parallelogram that becomes very squat and flat. The calculations, there's going to be errors introduced in the calculations as it's looking at that node shape versus something that's nice and square. So it's going to give you an assessment of, of how that looks. Um, also looking at node numbering, you inadvertently number two nodes of the same number, they will produce, the, they will treat each other as though they were one node. So those masses, even if they were in two completely separate areas of the model, the software doesn't know the difference. So the model can help you check you have unique node numbers. So uh, all of this, uh, we actually do, uh, we put together model guidelines within our team saying, you know, please follow these checks. The tools are available to you. Please go through them and uh, we produce just a very quick report saying that I verified the quality, I verified my node counts. I use the visual tools as well in the software. So the software will put a color map up for you of where your properties are. This is white, this is black tape, this is gold. You need to visualize it and say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Or why did I put gold on that surface? That's not correct. So doing those sorts of verifications as well before you ever hit the run button are very important. 
that's interesting too to hear more about like the industries because I mean documentation and traceability is really important for well really for for a lot of things but for spacecraft especially um, so it's it's interesting to hear how you guys kind of um, I guess internally verify all of that you know I think logistics are interesting um, I think I, maybe I'm weird I don't know <laughs> um, well, you're just an engineer yeah <laughs> We love processes. Um, we we want to learn from past experiences. And as we've gone through this and, you know, in, in my 20 years and running a certain number of models, you start to see what works and what's helpful and we write it down. Mm -hmm. So we make sure to use that and continue improving on our processes. Very cool. As a follow up question, as you go about checking your models, um, are there any other sorts of questions that are you feel like are, are important to ask as you're actually creating the model and then going about um, developing the hand calculations to support it. This question came from this memory that I had of, um, we were sitting in a conference room and going over the thermal model. And I remember you were asking John, like, does that make sense to you? And, uh, you know, he would say, you know, like, yes, or mm -hmm. mm, maybe things like that is what I wanted to elucidate with that question is like, what questions do you have to ask yourself as you're actually going about the modeling process, like, uh, oh, you know, does this make sense? And if it doesn't make sense, why doesn't it make sense? I think the answer to your question really comes back to, you know, doing the hand calculations cal calculations and, and verifying the results. So the reason we're doing all of that is, is asking the question, does this make sense to me? I ran a model, I got some results. Here are my results. I'm going to go present them to my manager. Before I want to stand up and, and give that presentation, I want to ask myself, does this look right? Um, some of the things you can look for is if you have uh, two panels that are bonded together or perhaps at a bolted joint. And if one panel is five degrees different than the other panel, and they're right next to each other, there's probably something incorrect in the model there. So you want to interrogate the results a little bit, uh, looking for continuity across interfaces that should be conductive looking at temperatures that generally make sense uh, based on your rough understanding of where uh, where the spacecraft should be, where that temperature should be. Just just sort of, yeah, that scratching your head, does this make sense? Uh, is it believable? Um, before you take it up the, the chain of command, if you will. Okay. No, that's that's very good advice. Thank you. <laughs> sorry, sorry, <laughs> that question was kind of messy. <laughs> um, so another important area of thermal modeling also comes with thermal integration because you you may be putting several parts into one larger instrument or an instrument into a larger spacecraft. So what things do you typically have to consider when it comes to doing model integration and uh, what other kinds of things do you have to look out for? So, so we kind of talked about we have the system level analyst um, or thermal engineer that, that's sort of monitoring all the sub models coming together and helping provide that guidance. Uh, the guidance they'll give is not only a total node count, for example, but uh, they'll give guidance on the node numbering. We talked about if nodes are the same number, the software doesn't know how to tell the difference, that that's one part and this is another part. So we want to make sure the node number is unique. So you'll get assigned a, uh, a quantity of numbers for your hardware. Uh, the, the system uh, thermal engineer will also dictate uh, how properties should be named. Uh, the database can get very large with a lot of properties coming in from different models, so we want to make sure that those remain organized. Uh, there may also be guidance on the types of properties to use. We have common material databases, you know, with certain white paints look like um, and uh, black paints and anodized surfaces, so making sure we use a uniform set of uh, properties, that's included as well. Um, there, there's a lot of features in software like Thermal Desktop, which can you can put case sets together, orbit definitions together, so There'll be guidance on how those are set up, uh, how they're named, uh, and how they're exercised. Even things like uh, the model time step, you know, the calculation period is basically doing an iterative solution. Is it iterating every five seconds or every minute or even every five minutes, depending the uh, calculation that, that you're looking for and the fidelity of the results you're looking for. So all of that is discussed in advance so that when you bring the models together, they actually uh, play well. And I guess the other thing I'll mention too is in a 3D coordinate space. Know, know your coordinate system, deliver in the correct coordinate system or else your instrument will be hanging way outside the instrument <laughs> or your instrument will be outside the spacecraft. So you, you do want to make sure that we're all talking the same language in three-dimensional space. So we define that coordinate system in advance. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point that you brought up about coordinate systems. Uh, to, to actually dig into that a little bit more, how do you actually define your starting reference point or like your zero zero as you might call it in the thermal model so that everything is consistent? So when we're doing spacecraft models, uh, if you're looking at a very large system, zero zero might be at the key optical surface or perhaps at the uh, launch vehicle adapter plate or something, something of significance to, to the large vehicle. But then when you're an instrument and you're in a somewhat obscure location in three-dimensional space in this vehicle, that zero zero is, is a very you know, sort of odd obtuse number away from you. Right. So you'll pick your zero zero to be the nice you know, crisp corner on your instrument or perhaps your interface mounting point. And we have to know how your coordinate system, your zero origin aligns with the zero origin for the next model delivery. So deliver in that context, make sure that you've moved your coordinate system so that you land in the correct place or else, again, you won't, you won't be seated correctly within the spacecraft vehicle. Yeah, that is extremely important. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for mentioning that. <laughs> so uh, when, it, when it comes to doing model integration, um, how, many, like how many thermal engineers actually work on an instrument versus a, a larger spacecraft? Uh, well, that, that depends on the mission. Um, certainly in some of our very large missions, we'll have uh, 10, 15 thermal engineers each taking a piece, maybe even more than that. Um, on a very small uh, instrument, such as a CubeSat, the Phoenix CubeSat, uh, you may just have one thermal engineer who's responsible for, for the various elements or perhaps one or two engineers working on that together. But when you look at these large systems, uh, often we'll have the system integrator someone who puts it all together, uh, someone who deals with the spacecraft bus, some of the aspects you know, related to propulsion and attitude control. And then you'll have a primary thermal engineer for each of the instruments. And there may be several instruments on board. If we think about our Mars rover, we have a variety of instruments on board the rover. And so there's engineers assigned to each of those instruments. And depending on their complexity, they may have a team of engineers working for them. So uh, we each have a role to play. And uh, the deliveries are, are defined from the top down, so each person knows uh, their their piece of the pie, if you will. I see. So, so do you guys typically um, like deliver versions of of thermal models, so that way the the primary integrator can see how everything is starting to come together, and then give um, direction as necessary from there. Is that kind of how that whole process is normally managed? Absolutely. Absolutely. It takes, okay. it takes several years to get these missions through from their concept to their final design into our hardware builds. So we have a couple of critical reviews. Uh, we'll usually have an early conceptual design review where uh, we're, we're just putting the pieces together and understanding the system and, and verifying the viability of this design. Uh, so we'll deliver models for that. Uh, there's preliminary design review, PDR, which is where we've really Converged on what the system needs to do, and we have a design that closes that we think meets all the goals. Then we move into critical design reviews, where this is where we're releasing drawings and we're finalizing documentation. We're actually going out to fabricate flight hardware. So again, our models are updated for that review and making sure everything still closes. And then at the very end, when you deliver your hardware, you deliver a model with it. This is this is what I built. And that model will include all of the as-built information, uh, the, the precise mass of components will actually weigh the hardware, and then we'll adjust the model to take into account that the particular mass. And we'll also tune our models into the thermal testing results, which I think we'll talk about a little later, uh, making sure that the model really represents the behavior of this particular uh, component. Very cool. So kind of segueing off of uh, thermal design and now kind of going into more of the thermal control methods. So one area I, I thought would be really cool to explore in this episode is you know, much of your experience has, has been in designing thermal control for optical systems. And um, I, I've found that a uh, really important of designing these is the, the stop analysis, or uh, I guess what they call the structural thermal optical performance analysis try saying that 10 times fast. <laughs> um, but this was something that we really didn't do like in depth for Phoenix because we weren't actually designing the optics themselves. So I was, I was curious to actually kind of delve into this topic a little bit with you. So um, kind of going, going off of that, what actually goes into a stop analysis cycle, I guess, um, as we'll say, 
And what are some of the typ typical trade-offs that you normally make along the way? Right. So stop analysis is actually uh, one of my favorite. Um, that's, that's something I started very early in my career. Um, back when I was in Raytheon, I mentioned um, one of my first projects was a small optical instrument uh, that actually was taking really beautiful images of the earth. So uh, yeah, it was, it was a very interesting discipline for me because it highlighted the importance of thermal engineering as a system entity. So as you mentioned, structural thermal optical performance, and as the name suggests, all these people are involved. So uh, the purpose of stop analysis is really to understand the performance, how the thermal performance of a system will ultimately affect its structure and then its optical performance. And you think about if you have an optical table with these various components on board, and it's very important that the optics stay aligned to each other, if you were to heat that table, you could imagine it would thermally breathe, it would expand, and it'd be cool, it would contract. And those movements will, will cause changes in the optical path. And when you're talking about very precise measurements, changes in the order of nanometers matter. These are, these are small numbers that we really kind of try to put our head around, but in an optical system that can make or break uh, the ability to get the science data. So we want to explore and understand how our thermal control system is contributing to those overall errors. So uh, the way we do this is uh, first from the top down, the optical engineers are describing to us what the uh, critical performance parameters are for this instrument. It can't move more than this much. And they, they talk about it in terms of wave front error, the way of describing how the, the optical path is shifting in their system. We then are able to convert that into uh, mechanical movement, so nanometers. And once we know what the mechanical movement is, now we can go into our models and assess how much is, is this uh, instrument going to breathe. And I say that thermally breathe. So uh, the thermal engineer, will produce a model uh, in parallel with the structural engineer. And the two of them communicate on a regular basis to make sure that, like we talked about, the coordinate systems are correct. The models are in the same place in three-dimensional space. And then they look at component by component, do the meshes match? So what the thermal engineer is putting together, what the structural engineer is putting together, are they similar enough in geometry? Because what we're gonna do next is once we produce thermal predictions, we're gonna map those to the structural model. And tools like Thermal Desktop have this built in where you import both models. They're both in, on, on your screen in your software. You tell it to map and it will look for the closest node. So in the structural model, then look for the closest thermal node and interpolate the temperature. So you have to have things aligned well enough to get the most accurate temperature mapping. So, so there's a lot of uh, careful work together in that process to make sure the mapping goes smoothly. And then once that's completed, the thermal engineer runs their tools, say in NASTRAN, and they say, given this temperature profile, how much does the material shift? Then we get to talk about, you know, what do we do to fix it if it's moving too much? Which is maybe your next question. <laughs> what do we do? Right. <laughs> it is my next question. <laughs> um, um, so, so you mentioned that and th there's a lot of structural mapping between these. Um, so how do you actually go about breaking that down with an instrument? Like, do you, um, do you start off with the full system or do you just break it down and, and then kind of look at more of the instrument as you kind of perfect one small thing? Yeah, so it, we do start looking at it in pieces. Um, it really comes down to, you know, working with the optical engineers and the optical mechanical engineers to know what the sensitivities are. Uh, for example, in the current project of working right now for this coronagraph instrument, we have an optical bench and a variety of optics on board and it has to be very thermally stable. So the optical engineers can inform the thermal engineers, these are the most critical elements. These need to be stable and in alignment with each other, which leads us to look at the optical bench. How is the bench changing in temperature? How, how is it deforming and how is that affecting performance? So we can do analysis just at the bench level. But eventually we want to add the details. So eventually we want to add all those optical elements and perform a more complete analysis. So then we start increasing the fidelity of our models. And then when we look at the mapping, we can actually tell the software to map things independently. So we can say, here's our bench and here's our optics. Map this optic to this optic and this optic to this optic and break it down one by one. And, and the, it gives the software better instruction. So if you had two elements very close together, the software may not know, do I grab this one or this one? So you're telling it this group goes here and this other group goes on the other side. 
So yeah, you start breaking it down. And again, you have to work that with your structural engineer. So thermal engineer and structural engineer together deciding which groups are mapping to the individual areas. Gotcha. So what what are some of like the major challenges that you've you've faced uh, from experience with doing stop analyses? Uh, very small numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Nanometers are difficult. Um, right. Some, some really great challenges. It's it's so interesting. It's a it's a really neat discipline, and I think as as our technology improves, it becomes even more and more important. Um, you have to you just have to do trade offs. Uh, we start to learn mm -hmm. tips and tricks for uh, ways to to improve the stability of our systems. Uh, you can improve it in the thermal side by having better thermal control, and I say that you know in air quotes. Um, you can achieve better control with uh, the types of avionics you're using, uh, the types of temperature sensors you're using to read, uh, the, the method of control, whether it's a PID controller. So then you have to tune in the parameters for proportional integral and derivative constants. Uh, so you'll learn that in your control okay. theories classes. Um, or if you can actually have what we call a bang-bang controller, which is control to turn on and off at a particular dead band, that tends to introduce st instabilities, so we often don't, don't see that for these more stable systems. But you can you know, look at it from a thermal perspective. Uh, you can also look at it from a materials perspective. There are some materials that would thermally breathe less than others. We call those low CTE, low COVID tension. So the benefit of using those materials is that it can tolerate a wider temperature range and not produce as much mechanical deformation and thus, you know, it would be better for an optically stable system. But sometimes these materials are more expensive. Sometimes these materials will have a uh, reduced thermal conductivity. So while you're gaining the ability to take more thermal perturbation, you're also losing the ability to conduct heat and smear it out as evenly across that surface. So it, Again, really, it's a trade and it's a system design activity where you need to understand what what the what the system requires and and what you need to meet it. Okay, it's an interesting discipline. I, I really find stop very interesting. <laughs> oh, it is very interesting. Yeah, it's um, there's a lot at play there, and so I think it's it's a really cool um, thing to examine. Kind of going off of that, you mentioned trades, and so. When it comes to designing like the, uh, the thermal control system overall, like there's really, like you were saying, you're the, you know, there's no one end all solution. Um, so how do you kind of go about figuring out what the best method of thermal control is for an instrument or a spacecraft? Uh, well, you know, it goes back to what's required. Um, if if we're looking at, um, I think the Phoenix CubeSat may have been this example where a larger temperature range would be acceptable. It didn't need a precise thermal stability. Uh, we, we look at those bang-bang controllers. They're, they're you know, less expensive and less complex to implement. Um, you can use these controllers either in a software fashion where the software will turn on the heater at a certain temperature and turn it off at, at a different temperature and let it cycle. You can even implement that uh, mechanically with something we call a mechanical thermostat, which much like a thermostat in your own house, it will turn on the system at a certain temperature and then turn it off uh, mechanically and use the bimetallic uh, spring in those devices to open and close the heater circuit. What's nice about those is you don't need avionics, you don't need electronics to drive it. So that can be cheaper for a system overall if it can just passively uh, manage its own temperature without, without the active control. But again, if you're looking at these optical systems that require a great deal of control, then you're going you're going to probably be looking at uh, various control circuits within the avionics, and, and that's where we get our software team and our electronics team involved, so they can provide that level of control. Okay. So another uh, area of thermal control is for of like the the methods that you use for um, actually analyzing the the system, and we definitely like we we learned a. a few really important thermal analysis methods from you while we were working on the Phoenix CubeSat that I, I wanted to touch on in here because I, I think they're important to um, at least, you know, con convey to, for, for students like me who are, uh, who are working on CubeSats and, and may not know, know what these are. So one of those was a uh, heat flow map. So I was wondering if we could just discuss uh, what this is, why it's important, and then how you normally go about making one. 
So heat flow map is a really great way to understand your system and, and put it on paper in a way that you can convey to others. As uh, so we had talked about doing, you know, basic hand calcs and what the hand calcs allowed us to understand is what is the heat flow? You know, how many watts are going across this interface and therefore producing this temperature difference that we see in, in the model. And so what we can do is put together on, on you know, pen and paper, going old school here, um, actually drawing up the, the heat flow diagram. So saying, and given a certain node indicated here with five watts dissipation, where's that five watts going? It's, it's going to go through a conductive path through say this aluminum plate out to a radiator here, maybe three watts goes out that way. But then we, another watt is lost via radiation to this component over here. And then you know, the final watt over somewhere else. Uh, the important thing is that heat balances. So you have to account for all the energy. It goes somewhere, it doesn't disappear. So it's being transferred in one method or another. And so what you're doing is documenting the heat flow and how it's transferring within the spacecraft. And that can give you a lot of insight into how the system's put together and how you can improve. So if then you're going, wow, I'm losing too much heat via radiation to this nearby component, I really want my heat to go out this radiator. Well, now I need to cut off that heat flow. How do I do that? Then we get into tools like multi-layer insulation or thermal blankets, they're known as, which is a technique we use to basically cover a component with uh, multiple independent layers of mylar. And in the vacuum of space, when you don't have convective heat flow, you just have radiation through those layers. But a shiny layer looking at another shiny layer looking at another shiny layer you can see that in series, this will reduce the amount of heat flow through that barrier interface. So a blanket would help reduce the heat flow from your component out to another component, which then uh, changes your overall heat balance. It's really important to put those maps together and uh, understand your system. Yeah, definitely. I think on Phoenix, it definitely really helped us double check ourselves and make sure that, like you were saying, make sure that we understand everything that's going on and make sure that everything actually makes sense. So yeah. Um, we like heat flow maps. <laughs> so heat flow maps are your friends. They're a great tool. Mm -hmm. Another method that, that we, we learned from you was more of like a, was sensitivity studies. And we kind of, we explored those more in the later half of the project, but they're still uh, really important for thermal control overall. So can, can you explain for our audience, can you explain what sensitivity studies characterize and why they are important to do? Sure. So when, when you're putting in a thermal model, I always say uh, your model is only as good as its inputs. So you're predicting for a given scenario, this is how the spacecraft is going to perform. You've assumed the, the, the sun location, the orbital environment, the heat loads internal to the system, the material properties, you know, how well things can emit heat, so forth, radiate heat, and you get a result. But then you ask yourself, well, what if something were to change? Let's say my, uh, my white paint, which is you know, a, a coating we use because it has very high uh, radiative uh, heat rejection capability or, or em IR emissivity, uh, maybe that emissivity isn't as high as we thought. So that would change the heat flow uh, coming out of that radiator, which in turn would change the temperature of the radiator, the temperature of the components. So, you want to poke at some of the features in your model that, that could vary and see how the results may change. Because if you aren't exactly what you predicted, how hot could it really get? How cold could it really get? And so we'll do that in two ways. Uh, one is we'll try to stack the worst case, call a worst case analysis saying, well, things really don't go our way and everything's kind of at the top end of, of the parameter of for each of these key parameters, this is how hot we could get. Or if everything tends to bias the other way, this is how cold we can get. But then you can look at the individual features. In optical systems, this is incredibly important. We're trying to hone in on that very precise thermal control. But what if the, the conductive interface between these two interfaces was a little different? How would that change my results? Am I, am I still meeting requirements? And when you perform these sensitivities, it's like turning knobs. I kind of picture myself in front of a panel, just turning one knob after another. How does this change? How does this mm -hmm. change? It'll give you insight. You'll say, wow, the conductivity right here was so important that had a huge effect in my performance. Whereas this one here, not so much. And what that can direct you to do is pay more attention to that in the design and in the hardware implementation process. And it may also encourage you to perform additional testing. The conductance across this interface really matters. I'm gonna test it. 
by itself and make sure I really have a good understanding of, of how that particular joint is performing so that you know I don't introduce unexpected errors in my final results and ultimately in, in your flight. Right. Yeah, the um no, all of all of those are amazing points. Um, that yeah, like the sensitivity studies that we did towards the end were more with our standoffs. Um, we changed the material of our standoffs between a, a, just aluminum or just stainless steel or a mix of aluminum and, and stainless steel, and it didn't. What we saw is that it didn't really produce a whole lot of difference in just the um, the allowable flight temperatures, the maximum allowable flight temperatures they got they got up to, but it did change the um, the battery's heater cycle. How long that was on uh, within the orbit, and I, I can't recall the specific numbers off the top of my head, but I think one was on for the whole orbit, in our in our colder orbits, and then another with this mix of aluminum and stainless steel standoffs between all of our electrical components. It was on for half of the orbit, and so it, um, like you were saying, like it, it really does doing these kinds of sensitivity studies really does reveal a lot about the thermal system that you're working with and how important all of those conductive links are. Yeah, that was a really great find. It was good work by the team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. And it's, it's kind of, it's funny too, because um, it wasn't something that, it, it's not like a, uh, I guess it wasn't obvious to us at first. It wasn't something that, that we would have maybe initially originally changed, but we were kind of we ended up being kind of constrained to that because at, at the point when we were doing this sensitivity study, like everything had been machined and that really there aren't a whole lot of things within the cube set that you can kind of play around with uh, thermally aside from having radiator panels and then the, the choice of the structure. Um, but you're just, you're so confined to the small volume that it's all based on placement and if you want to add in heat straps or anything like that. So, yeah. Definitely learned a lot from that. That was that was very, very, very good thing to do. Can you are you allowed to share any like notable sensitivity studies that you have worked on in the past that you've learned a lot from? Well, I mean, you say notable sensitivity studies. I each project is notable. <laughs> it's, right. It's the funny and amazing thing about this industry is there's there's a lot of standards and things that are sort of our go-tos in the thermal community and methods of approach, but every system is unique and every system has some level of trade-offs that are required. And it's always a balancing act of finding, you know, what what methods will work. So it, it's honestly a lot hard for me to say like one that would really stand out to me, but uh, it's unique experience each time and that's that's why it's important we go through these exercises that's fair all right so now to segue into the fun part uh where we actually get to comes down to sticking hardware in a chamber and and testing it and actually getting all of the data that will verify how accurate your model is um so so tvac testing is a pretty big campaign and there are different types of testing that you can do within um, just the TVAC testing campaign in general. So to, to give context on TVAC testing, I, I thought let's let's just quickly break down um, the different tests that, that are normally done here. So like the difference between thermal cycle, thermal balance, and fake out is also part of that. Sure. Um, well, I guess first you say TVAC, uh, that's sort of our industry common terminology for thermal vacuum. And there's a lot of reasons that we go into a vacuum. I mean, most notably, uh, the systems we're designing uh, operate in the vacuum space. So we really want to understand and exercise the hardware as best as we can on the ground for what it's ultimately going to see in the space environment. And there's also a lot of things that we're looking at uh, in TVAC, and you brought up a few of them. Uh, one I'll just mention off the top is a uh, bake out. Uh, so materials outgas, um, certain uh, contaminants and, and uh, components uh, from, you know, at higher temperatures. So what we'll often do for things like paint, for example, if you've ever smelled paint after you apply paint in your house, it's outgas. It's, it's relieving uh, some of those com chemical components, but we don't want that to happen uh, near critical optics, for example, because it could result in a residue coating on the optics. So we'll put those, those assemblies in a chamber and raise them to an elevated temperature in vacuum for a period of time, which will release uh, the, the, the excess and uh, result in basically what we call a clean interface, uh, the, the clean material. 
So uh, bake out is one thing that we'll do in vacuum for, for applied uh, surface coatings. Uh, the other two critical things we do in thermal vacuum are thermal cycling and thermal balance. So thermal cycling refers to the testing where we're running the hardware through its paces. Uh, we talked about qualification temperatures, which is the temperature range in which you're designing uh, the, the instrument, uh, the most extreme range. We tend to fly it in a more narrow range. We hold that margin to our allowable flight. But we have to show the hardware works at qualification. Just in case if anything were to happen on orbit or we need to make a decision to let it go to a wider range, we, we know what our limits are. So we'll put it through its paces, put the hardware in the chamber, and run it up and down in temperature to its coldest extreme and its hottest extreme, and also dwell at those temperatures for a prescribed amount of time, uh, depending on the type of hardware, so that we ensure that it's really experienced and soaked at those temperatures and uh, demonstrated robustness to go uh, forward with flight. So uh, that's part one of our TVAC testing. And then part two is, is the part that's really interesting for the thermal engineer, which is thermal balance. And really what, what you want to know as you, you spent your time designing and modeling the spacecraft is, is how well did you do? Is your model accurate? Is it predicting and behaving the way that you expect? And uh, the thermal balance campaign gives you that opportunity. You'll usually define a few dwells. So you'll pick a survival case, for example, the coldest uh, anticipated environment for the spacecraft, and then maybe a cold operational case and a hot operational case. And what you're doing is using your test facility, your, your vacuum chamber, to emulate your external environment. So we're pulling vacuum, that's one thing. We also want to create a cold environment um, around the spacecraft because, you know, say you're, you're looking at a large system that is going in a space cruise or in an orbit, and it's looking at cold space. So you have these chamber shrouds that we run liquid nitrogen through to cool them as much as is reasonably possible here on the ground to simulate the cold of space. So then you're, you're actually getting the proper thermal environment. And then you may also include in your thermal vac a local heating. If you know you're going to get sun energy on a panel, and if that's a critical parameter, we can use uh, lamps that emulate the uh, heating energy from the sun or we can put other hot targets nearby to produce radiative boundary conditions. And then you also start looking at your uh, test fixturing in GSE. If maybe you're an instrument that's mounted to a spacecraft and you know that you, you're on a temperature control plate, you'll put a temperature control plate in your vacuum chamber and, and emulate um, the spacecraft environment and then test yourself against that. So we do all of that, and then we have data that we can look at and compare to our models. It's all part of the motto of test as you fly. Test fly as, as you test. fly, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, to, to give some scale, like these chambers aren't small, like they're huge. You know, you have to fit the whole spacecraft in there. Do you guys also have like smaller uh, TVAC chambers at JPL for just testing like the smaller instruments or? We do. We actually have a, a group called the Environmental Test Lab on JPL's campus and they manage the majority of our test chambers. They're all over the lab. Uh, we have several smaller chambers in individual facilities. And then we have a couple of our big chambers up the hill. Um, and we actually have one that is a 25 foot diameter chamber. So it's extremely 25. large. <laughs> it's, that's an older, uh, and I should know the date, but I won't attempt to quote it, but it's, it's over 50 years old. And uh, it's, it's actually, I think, a national landmark. Um, <laughs> <laughs> really? That's awesome. Yeah, it's, My God, that's like five of me. Yeah, it's, oh, it's an enormous chamber, but it's been really important in some of JPL's past missions. We've had some very large mm -hmm. spacecraft that uh, was necessary to have a chamber big enough to, to test in. So, and that's still operating today. They, they keep it in very good shape and, uh, you know, updating it with some of the latest technology. But uh, we have a really great crew uh, that helps manage uh, the operation of all those chambers. Very cool. So I guess when you, when you do TVAC testing, do you normally know how the chamber works inside and out? Or are you trained up on that? Or is it kind of like you are mostly a chamber monitor and then the guys who normally man that facility are like their chamber operators and they are the people you call at two in the morning when something within the chamber is like not working? They're with me all day and all night. It, it, is, it is their job to operate the chamber. They, they are well versed in, in the ins and outs of how the chamber works. They're, they're mechanical gurus. Um, as a thermal engineer, you want to know uh, the, the key aspects of the chamber in order to work with these folks. Uh, you know, what temperature can they go down to? What, what, what does the shroud configuration look like? And I say shroud, it's kind of this you know, surface inside the chamber that's temperature control that we can flood to liquid nitrogen or we can even control at some intermediate temperatures depending on your test need. So you want to understand, you know, what, what is the geometry of those shrouds? What are the temperatures that can be controlled? How stable can it be controlled? 
um, all of those features. You also need to know how hard of a vacuum can you pull. You know, some chambers are rated to higher vacuum than others, and it depends on the instrument you're testing. So, so you get to know these folks really well um, and understand the capability of their hardware, but when it comes to executing the test, they're, they're the ones actually making the changes on the chamber and you're directing them on what you need. Okay, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I'm sure they probably think of those chambers as like their, I don't know, first or second childs or something like oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> <If they're, laughs> um, so uh, quickly going back to the, the thermal cycles, what number really defines the number of cycles that you do within um, thermal cycle testing. Is that just dependent on, um, I guess, how much you how much you want to stress the system and how long you want the TVAC duration to go? So uh, we have guidelines for this. Um, again, you know, industry has been doing this a long time and people learn lessons uh, along the way. And we have institutional practices in place, uh, much like we have for our temperature margin requirements, we have requirements on uh, thermal cycling. So it stipulates a certain number of cycles, say, for example, three cycles uh, between the hot and cold dwells and how many hours, whether it's, you know, 144 hours or maybe just 70 hours. Uh, but that's indicated in our environmental test uh, plans. And so your, your mission assurance engineer will work with you and your environmental engineer to uh, ensure you understand your requirements and uh, conduct your tests according to those. Yeah, I think with, um, we didn't really have standards that we we didn't have like strict industry standards so like it's 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 interesting to to talk about the differences between what's very strictly done in the industry which versus like what can be done with university student cubesat projects because for us i mean pretty much everything was defined internally there wasn't a requirement from nasa or a launch provider that we had to pass tvac test before we launched the iss so i mean you should do a system level tvac test if you can because it's really important to verify everything at the system level, but I mean, no one, but no one required it of us. Um, but that's also because, you know, there's a great deal of risk reduction with CubeSats since they're a lot less complex and off the shelf hardware has already been put through several thermal cycles by the vendor before it's ever been shipped to you. So for Phoenix, the most important thing that we were going to get out of TVAC testing was that the data could have been used for calibrating our payload. And we would have had a, a much better understanding of the performance of our payload as it changed with temperature. So, but other than that, I mean, we knew that on a component level, all of our hardware was expected to survive space conditions. Right, absolutely. And, and you know, an a environmental engineer responsible for that on a project will look at the vendor testing as well. Um, they just want to make sure that each component has gone, gone through its paces like I, I like to say, um, it's mm -hmm. been exercised over a range of temperatures. If that's been done at the vendor and to our satisfaction, then we can check that box and uh, move to the next level of assembly. Absolutely. But if, if some things can't be tested to the vendor, perhaps because they need to go to a higher level of integration first, then we will make sure to conduct that testing on our side. Uh, so most components are thermally cycled before they're integrated with the final system. Right. Yeah, because that's also, that's not a short test either. Like getting from hot to cold and then cold to hot takes at least a day or so, yeah. so right? <laughs> Depending on the temperature <laughs> you're going to and the method in which you're heating it, uh, radiation is a slow mm -hmm. process. Thermal mass is something to think about. We, we didn't really get a chance to talk about, you know, transient behavior too much uh, today, but right. uh, the mass of an item uh, really has an impact on how quickly it can change temperature um, as well as you know, how much heat you're applying. You think of, you know, a, a big uh, metal ball, heating that up is going to take a long time, you know, simply because, right. because of its mass. So when you have a very large uh, system or spacecraft in the chamber, if you're trying to heat it radiatively or even more challenging, cool it radiatively, that takes many, many hours. So TVAC tests are long um, necessarily, but, but very important because you hit on another point, test as you fly. A test as you fly is is a key um, guideline in the industry because we, we don't want surprises. We want to exercise the system as, as best as we can within our, our ground capabilities so that we know what it's going to do on orbit. And as much as possible, we do not want to deviate from the flight configuration. So because with each change, that introduces a certain amount of uncertainty in the system. Right. That's actually, that's a good segue into one question I had, which is what things are generally important to test for when it comes to 
uh, doing TVAC tests. So for, for example, one thing that was important for us to at least verify with Phoenix was, you know, you're, you want to see your battery heater turn on at a certain temperature and then turn off at another temperature. You want to verify that, that functionality, for example. What kinds of things are normally tested for in the projects that you've worked on? And can you give some examples from either past or current projects of maybe more specific things that have been important to look at? Sure. Um, you hit the nail on the head with functionality. We want to know that everything will work. Um, from a thermal point of view, heaters are one of the active elements that we're monitoring. So we want to test each of the heater circuits. And there's usually a primary and a redundant circuit because we want to protect ourselves if there were to be an issue uh, somewhere in the control circuit in flight. So we want to exercise uh, all of the actively controlled heater circuits. The avionics will power a circuit on or off and, and demonstrate that it's controlling temperature or you know, clicking in that dead band on and off over a prescribed temperature range. We also want to make sure all of our mechanical thermostat controlled heaters trigger. So we, we discussed that those are passive elements that open and close the circuit based on the temperature of the hardware. And we want to make sure, it's usually these are survival type pieces, make sure the hardware gets cold enough to trigger that heater on and watch it cycle several times. So we know that mechanical thermostat is working properly. Uh, deployments are another big thing, um, particularly like on the Mars 2020 mission, we have a series of deployments for our rover. So those will actually be exercised in a TVAC condition. Um, and actually for the rover, because it works on Mars, there's a simulated uh, atmospheric environment similar to what Mars would see. So they'll, they'll actually do testing and show that the rover deployments will work and things will operate in that environment under the prescribed temperatures. So that's all very important. Gotcha. Kind of, I, I guess, seg segueing off of that, um, to dive a, a little bit into TVAC preparation, before you actually put it in the TVAC chamber, you have to be able to create the environment, like, like you were saying, for, for the spacecraft or for your instrument. Um, and so how do you go about figuring out like what exactly the temperature of the shroud should be and, uh, and how that also couples with, you know, maybe if you're on a, um, like a, uh, if you're conductively coupled to a, a platform, uh, how both of those have to play together in order to create the right kind of thermal environment. So uh, your models can really help you with this. Um, and we right. talked about, and we actually did this on Phoenix, is uh, sort of mm -hmm. backing out the equivalent environment. Uh, we'll call it the black box model. Um, because we, we're exercising the, the flight model of this instrument in its orbit, experiencing the earth loading, experiencing the solar loading, and, and all these other parameters. But then you're asking yourself, how can I emulate that in a chamber? So we can use the model and create surfaces outside of, of the model in orbit and calculate what all the various heat loads are. Once we understand what those are, you can calculate an effective thermal sink, so an effective temperature. So basically, instead of the spacecraft looking at its real environment, now what if it were looking at just a, a black shroud? Shrouds are often painted black mm -hmm. because it's a, it's a very convenient way to um, radiate heat. So if we're looking at that shroud and what temperature would that need to be to create a similar heat flow onto the spacecraft than what, uh, than what it would have in orbit? And then what you'll do is you actually model your chamber and you'll run the model and you're putting those temperatures on your shroud and seeing if the instrument in the chamber in fact behaves the way your instrument does in flight. And there are sacrifices you have to make. You cannot perfectly emulate the space environment. We can't get to right. you know, space cold temperatures. We get to around 80 Kelvin uh, with liquid nitrogen. So we know there's going to be some deviations, but understanding what those are and getting as close as possible is important. Yeah. So, f so for us on Phoenix, one of the main purposes of the black box model was simulating the temperature of each panel in orbit, and then using that information to baseline the temperature that the chamber shroud should be set to in order to create this flight-like environment for the spacecraft. Uh, and essentially to do that, the model consisted of this uh, empty 3U sized box that was given the same optical properties as the spacecraft. Uh, and then the thermal mass was assumed to be zero, so that the box was only the temperature of whatever it was actually looking at. And then the black box spacecraft was placed in the LEO, which you can do using thermal desktop's orbital simulation tool uh, to collect predictions of how the hardware would operate. So we performed a couple of hot and cold cycles to see how the spacecraft performed. And then based on the results of that, 
we found that the radiator was actually colder than a lot of the other panels. Um, and so because of that, we used the temperature of that panel to drive the temperature of the shroud that we actually used for TVAC testing. I unfortunately don't have any horror stories from uh, Phoenix thermal vacuum testing because we didn't, we actually ran out of schedule margin to really conduct a system level test. We wanted to use the time instead to make our flight software a little bit more robust. Um, but that's what, what we were planning to do and how we actually planned the TVAC procedure to go. One last question I want to ask about the TVAC process is uh, model validation, because you have to eventually validate that all of this stuff works. So when it comes to model validation, what knobs do you typically have to turn and how long does the overall process normally take? So, so we talked about that we can't perfectly emulate the flight environment. We, we do our best we can with the resources we have. Um, but in the end, uh, what the, the goal after you're at, out of TVAC and you make sure that everything's functioning properly, you want to also ensure that your model predicts the behavior that you saw in testing and resolve any discrepancies. Uh, we call that model correlation, um, also called model tuning. And really what that uh, points to is that we know we need to make changes in the model if it's not matching the test data. So we exercise the model in the test environment, given the, the uh, environments that we could apply in the test configuration. And we look at those results and compare those to what our model predicts and interrogate anything that, that looks to be off. And by off, I would say more than five degrees different as, as an example point. Um, then this, this goes back to everything we talked about at the beginning of our heat flow maps and our hand counts and understanding the system. If we see a temperature is different for this component, why, could, why would it be different? And we can look at, oh, but we know most of the heat flow is toward this other component. Okay, what, what temperature is that assembly at? Does that make sense? If we see a, a significant difference between the two than what we predicted, the conductivity between the two is probably not correct. Why would it not be correct? Well, what did we assume for our material properties? What did we assume for adhesives? What it, you know, looking at some of those details and even turning those numbers a little bit within the realm of what we consider our uncertainty in those material properties, can we make the model better match by changing that parameter? This can be a lengthy process <laughs> depending on how large your system is. Um, because if you're looking at a, a CubeSat, for example, uh, hopefully there's not too many inputs you put in your model that, that are opportunity to, to tune in, you're looking at a very large spacecraft. There are a lot of interfaces and a lot of assumptions being made. So we like to build up from the smallest level of testing up to higher levels of testing and, and making adjustments to the model as we go. But things you would look at, uh, uh, contact conductance, things that are bonded together and bolted together can be something that, that can be very tricky to quantify. Uh, one of the most difficult ones is actually uh, thermal blankets or multi-layer insulation. So we talked about those. Again, those are many layers of uh, low emissivity mylar stacked on each other that are used to reduce the heat flow from a component to, to the exterior of that component. But these are handmade. Uh, so we actually have a blanket shop uh, experts on lab that, that build these. Um, our, one, one of our lead uh, blanket designers and fabricators used to be a seamstress. Turns out that's an incredibly necessary skill. Um, right. <laughs> these, are, these are sewn together. So they're hand laid, uh, the individual layers put together and the edging carefully stitched and then they're assembled on the spacecraft. And so it's a soft good, it's, it's workmanship related. So the performance of those blankets is entirely dependent on how it was put together. So that can vary uh, with, with a somewhat uh, broad um, amount of deviation. So, We've done a lot of testing on these. We know roughly where they come in and the minimum and maximums. And then we can take that parameter and put that in our model as well. Um, other things you can look at, surface properties, uh, white paints, the black paints, and things we've talked about that uh, we can actually take direct measurements of and, and just better understand what those properties are and include that in our model versus the more standard industry assumptions. So a lot of knobs to turn. And in terms of how long it takes, it can take weeks. Because you're, if you change one thing and then something else moves, maybe that wasn't the right thing to change. So it's a little bit of a balancing act. So it takes a lot of time to, to really go through it thoroughly and have it reviewed. It's really important to have somebody review your work as well because that is your final model. You're going to flight on that model. You're making your final flight predicts. And then when you're on orbit, and somebody has a question about how the system's behaving, they're coming back to that model for answers. So 
you want to make sure that's verified. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's the, all of this has been really uh, like just incredible information. Um, I think that's all of my, my technical questions. I just have a couple of fun uh, ending ones. So the, the first one I have is, do you have any, as a, as a thermal engineer, do you have any favorite thermal jokes that commonly get passed around the office? <laughs> so but it's funny when you ask that one. And I always think about every time I'm in a meeting and the room is too hot, or the room is co too cold. It's inevitably get the thermal engineer to fix it. And to which I respond, <laughs> I only work in a vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite. But otherwise, yeah, hot and cold jokes, uh, they come up pretty often. Very nice. I like that one. I might, uh, that's, a, that's a handy one to have in Arizona, especially when it's, you know, it's, we've been in the over 110 degrees for the recently. So that's, yeah, <laughs> might steal that one from you. <laughs> Please um, do. All right. Very, very last question, uh, which is a, a fun one that I, I like to ask everyone is, um, what is a, just a fun favorite story that you have related to thermal engineering or TVAC from your experience? Um, so I think about, you know, fun, fun favorite times as a thermal engineer. Uh, we talk a lot about thermal vacuum testing. And uh, for me, it's the graveyard shift. Uh, I actually always volunteer to be on graveyard shift. I, I think, I don't know, it's the most interesting and fun. Uh, a lot happens. Uh, sometimes it's just a very quiet night where we're dwelling at a temperature, but sometimes it's, you know, a matter of the, the day team is wrapping up and saying, can you get us to the temperature conditions for the morning? So we want to keep going. So then uh, you, you have a lot of work happening and, and get to make a lot of changes uh, to get the system ready for the next set of tests. So I also think it's super fun to be with your coworkers uh, and their third cup of coffee trying to stay awake at four in the morning. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good time. I'll just say that. Uh, but one story I'd actually like to leave you with is uh, a bit of a cautionary tale. And I like to tell this one about how important it is to, um, to, to really carefully monitor uh, everything that's happening in TVAC. So I was a young engineer. Um, I think it was actually my first year. Uh, and I was working a graveyard shift uh, for a small instrument. And uh, we were intentionally running pretty close to the hot temperatures, uh, trying to uh, maximize uh, the range of the allowable flight temperatures and the performance. And uh, because we were sitting very close, uh, we, we always had uh, the system in, in a yellow alarm state, which is, you know, the software indicating to us, hey, you're getting pretty close to your upper limit, I keep it at a watch. But, you know, we're a couple of tenths of the degree away, and so everything seems fine and stable and um, not too worried about it until suddenly it went red alarm. <laughs> and I'm oh. like, oh, you're like, oh no, <laughs> that's not good. And, and what had happened is over a period of about six hours, it moved a couple tenths of a degree, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but the color changing sort of had me concerned. And the worst thing in the world is to have to call your test lead at you know some early AM hour and say, I just tripped an alarm limit, what do I do? <laughs> And I was young, but still, still learning the ropes. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't a critical temperature. Um, and he said, you know, we're okay, but I need you to turn it around and bring that temperature back down. And I learned it's like turning the Titanic because this was driven by the radiative environment. And we talked about the thermal mass matters and the radiation works slowly. So I changed the shroud temperatures and waited for what felt like forever, but was probably about 30 minutes to drop that 10th of a degree to bring us back down to yellow. So my cautionary tale is that now um, I'm very careful in monitoring the trend of temperatures. Even if it's a, a few tenths of a degree, sometimes that can be very important. And so you want to understand what's happening with your test, uh, regularly checking in, you know, in sort of 10 minute intervals of where, where things are trending so that you can take responses if needed. Because as a thermal engineer, we have to think ahead rather than be reactive. So that's my story. And I hope that's useful to you and anyone else who maybe uh, supporting TVACs in the future. Oh yeah, for sure. I will definitely keep that in mind. <laughs> so I guess to, to end this, thank you. Thank you so, so much for, for doing this with me and chatting with me. Um, this has been really, really amazing and I, I really appreciate your time, so thank you. This was so much fun. I'm, I'm glad to talk about something I really love. Uh, thermal engineering is, is a special place in my heart and I'm so uh, privileged to have it as a career. So thanks for letting me share with you today.
Thank you all for tuning in to another episode of The Art of Space Engineering. And thank you to Belinda especially, not only for doing this with me, but also for dealing with Zoom technical difficulties. Uh, because towards the end of the interview, my Wi-Fi cut out and our Zoom call just crashed. And I think the both of us just about had a heart attack because we thought we'd lost our entire conversation. So we had to backtrack a little bit and hence the random change in audio at the end there. You know, when I started this podcast, I thought it would lead to new adventures, but I didn't think heart attacks were included in that. So just add that to the list with the like six million other things that we've come to love about 2020. But anyway, that's all for this week's episode of The Art of Space Engineering. Tune in every two weeks for more conversations. If you've been enjoying this podcast and you want to support it, please share these episodes with your friends and don't forget to follow this podcast on Facebook for future updates. Also, if you have any feedback for the show or ideas for future episodes, feel free to shoot them my way. And here's looking forward to future adventures and the lessons learned from them. Cheers, Sarah.